Well, good morning everyone and welcome to our time of meditation, Nazareth Contemplative Prayer. Here we're in Dulwich Woods, right up near Sydenham Hill. And uh, it's the, uh, these ancient woods which Andrew Carter, my brother, who's an artist and a teacher, it's his favourite walk and he's going to be walking with me today with his dog Bobby and showing me round these beautiful woods. And I'm just going to begin with a psalm as we usually begin. My heart is ready, O God, my heart is ready. I will sing and give you praise. Awake, my soul, awake, harp and lyre, that I may awaken the dawn. I will give you thanks, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing your praise among the nations. For your loving kindness is as high as the heavens and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and your glory over all the earth. So here we are, here we are in these beautiful woods, ancient woods, with these wonderful trees. And uh, just show you Bobby, so you know that's the little Bobby who's with me. And Bobby belongs to Andrew, my brother, who's gonna show us round today. Hello, good morning everyone. Andrew, you've been uh, walking these woods most days during this time of, of the virus. What do you love about them? Well, the first morning that um, we were off work and I got up and wondered what I was going to do with myself, um, we came for a walk and I brought the dog up here and we took a right turn into a part of the forest, part of the woods that I'd never been to before. And the part of the walk that I'm taking you on today is that place. So this was a new discovery for me 10 weeks ago. And I really fell in love with it as a place. It feels very ancient and full of all sorts of different trees. And I find it very inspiring, especially early in the morning before most people are up um, to come and just look and see things and usually I'm walking with my dog and often walking with Helen my wife and we have a good conversation and we spot things and often on when we return home I try and make a piece of artwork based on one of the experiences one of the things that I've seen one of the things that I've heard one of the things that I've noticed so tell me what's so exciting about these woods um, I think they're very very peaceful and it's extremely quiet. You become amazingly aware of everything around you. You become aware of sounds, you become aware of smells, um, the tiniest noises. Um, but the thing that I love the most, the thing that I find the most exciting is the light. Um, and I suppose when I've been looking and when I've been noticing things, it's made me aware of the world around me, the natural world that's still left in London, and also um, maybe the way that I respond to it. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about all the time I've been coming here is when you look, um, when you look, how do we see things? And if you're trying to turn that into a piece of writing or trying to turn that into a painting, what do you notice and what do you remember? And when I was reading about these woods, I was interested to sort of think which other artists might have been here. And one of the artists that came here many, many years ago that all of you will have heard of um, is Vincent van Gogh, who came to Dulwich as a young man before he was even an artist. And I was reading this morning, actually, there's a great quote in the Dulwich Picture Gallery Visitors book where he said, it's quite simply, I had a nice day. <laughs> and I think, the idea that Van Gogh came here, but the, the painter that I really, really admire, who came here and lived here, lived nearby, um, is, a, is an artist called um, Camille Pizarro, who was the first Impressionist painter and became incredibly aware of um, how you might depict light. And I think one of the things that I've noticed in these woods every time I come, if we look up for a moment, if you look up, 
and you see these, this amazing oak tree above us, is it's too far away to see the individual leaves. And what you start to see is just the way the light is coming through the branches. So you see these different, most dappled variations of a, of a light lime green working towards a sort of deeper dark green. Um, and I think, I'm sure when Pizarro came here, he must have been thinking the same things that everyone probably is now. If you're trying to paint something like this, how do you do it? How do you make something that is real? How do you make something that is like the observation that you have in front of you? When I walk into this part of the wood, um, and I've talked about this sort of every day that I've come, it, it changes every day. It's actually, as we get further into the year, it's getting darker. Um, because obviously there are more leaves on the tree. And although the sun rises earlier, what we're seeing is something that is um, a space that is getting darker and richer. But when you stop for a moment and then look up, and what I love about this, we're in suddenly a part of the wood that is um, a series of beech trees and hornbeam trees. Um, and when you look up, and you look through, you get these amazing levels, these tiers of light. Everything's sort of pixelated. You could say like a computer screen of colour. That would be a bit of a dreary way of looking at it, but more like a, a sort of pointillist painting. And the pointillist painters were the late Impressionist painters. The artists like Seurat and Signac and Pizarro, painters that worked with sort of dots of pure pigment, dots, dots of colour to try and suggest light. And um, the other day when I was walking through here, I was um, aware that um, as you move, it seems to become like a series of layers, layers almost like an animation. And if we can walk very slowly with the camera and um, through this, feels to me, and, and I hope you get the same sensation, that this is like an early sort of church. Um, you feel like you're walking down an aisle with this incredible sort of canopy of leaves above your head. Um, and it's like a natural sort of building, but you're outside. And that's what I love about it. So do you think when you walk through nature like this, or a forest like this that it's a holy experience um, yes I think it's a very it's a really deeply spiritual experience but you have to change your way of thinking there's nothing here apart from the occasional fence that is man-made everything that is here is I suppose made made by God you know it's 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 happened and if you listen now you can hear a woodpecker Wait. Absolute treat. There's a woodpecker somewhere. And one morning, I'm holding the camera now. Um, I hope what I wanted to show you was walking through these trees that if I have the camera facing directly upwards, you get this amazing, amazing sort of pattern of changing light. And it's amazing. It's all around you. It's beautiful. Um, beyond sort of trying to describe it, really. I'm going to give the camera back to Richard. Why do you think it is, Andrew, that when you go into woods, it almost like hushes you? I, I can almost feel myself speaking with a hushed voice as we go through here, these trees. I think you become very aware of the sound of your feet on the ground in a wood. And I was thinking about this the other day, how the sounds that we hear sometimes when you're walking and tripping and stumbling and the sound of your feet on the earth take you right back to your own childhood. And I've just <laughs> tripped over a stump on the ground and, and I, the, 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 sort of the sound of tripping over is one that we are all familiar with, the sort of sound of your, your foot hitting a stump and nearly falling over. It takes you back to maybe being five or six again and grazing a knee or getting stung by a stinging nettle. These things take you back to your childhood. 
it's all senses. It's not just um, sound, it's also smell, isn't it? The smell of a wood is very evocative. Of, of, I can remember walks through Oxshot Woods when I was a kid and these same kind of smells. Um, we were talking about this yesterday, just thinking about how when you look at a computer screen and everyone at home is listening to this, maybe listening to this on a phone or on a computer screen, that there is no smell button or there's no taste button. Um, you can see things, but the one thing that you, when you are outside and you're in a wood like this, you can hear it, you can smell it, you can feel it, you can touch it. And the main thing is that it is all around you. And I know, you know, we live in an age of sort of being able to watch 3D films. Um, we've actually gone off track here. We've got lost, which is marvellous. <laughs> we've got to go back this way. I hope we're going to find our view point. It's very... It's very easy to get lost in woods, isn't it? Why is that? Well, <laughs> why is it easy to get lost in I the woods? It's easy to get lot, lost in the woods because you lose your bearings and, and there's no, there's no, you're trying to remember a particular tree or a particular branch. You're not remembering where Boots the chemist is or where WH Smith's is. You're trying to actually get your bearing from something that is um, a piece of the landscape. You need to go this way. So we're actually coming a different route to the one that we found yesterday. We need to go back now this way and find our refine our path. Can you hear the woodpecker again? Wonderful sound of a woodpecker. I love the sound of walking on a, the floor of a wood. It's almost like a drum. You can feel the years and years of compression of the, the leaves and the soil. It's got a kind of a drum-like quality as if you're walking on layers and layers of, of natural growth. We're back on the right path. Hello everyone. We, I lost my way for a moment, which is extraordinary. Um, I've walked here every day, as I said, for 10 weeks. I suddenly thought, where am I? Um, but the very first day I did this walk, I had the same feeling. I wasn't quite sure where I was going. Um, but the, the thing about any walk, the first time you do it, it's the most exciting. And I felt that the first day that I came here. I wondered where we would end up. Um, and I've lived in um, this part of London for 18 years and um, it's always exciting to go and find somewhere that's new and I set a project for my pupils at school um, a few um, weeks ago where I asked them to go out on their daily walk their what we call their isolation walk and to find an alphabet of shapes so they had to go out into the landscape or go out into the woods or go out through the park and find things that looked like letters but weren't letters. And they have discovered, and I got a very lovely um, message back from a pupil the other day, and she just said, um, thank you, Mr. Carter. I really enjoyed that project. It made me look at things that I'd never seen before. And I really thought, you know, chuffed with the idea that these pupils had made a piece of artwork about something that was in their locality, something they'd seen, something they'd noticed that they hadn't seen before um, and they are now taking those um, patterns, those shapes, those letters, that alphabet and making them into a three-dimensional Grayson Perry like sort of pot where they're going to decorate this thing with their, we call them their isolation walk pot um, and I think, I'm, well I'm very excited about seeing what they come up with but one of the things I was just trying to say I suppose is about that idea of going out exploring and you don't have to go to the 
Antarctic. You don't have to go to a great and famous city to go out exploring. You can be in a landscape, in any landscape, in the woods, in a park to see things. And if we look up at the moment, we're suddenly seeing through this beautiful, beautiful pattern of beech leaves. And one of the things I've always loved about beech leaves is the way you get these sort of transparencies happening where the leaves overlap each other and create this sort of dappled light. Um, that's very special. This is walking through underneath an ash tree and then suddenly we switch and under, we're walking underneath a hazel tree here. The hazel tree feels lovely and soft. It's beautifully soft. It's almost got a sort of fluffy base to it and it has a point at the bottom of it. A few years ago I sort of thought I really wanted to know what these trees were and somehow when you do know the name of a leaf, it helps you sort of understand what, what it is that you're looking at. So if we walk a tiny, tiny bit further, and we're walking underneath a different tree, just through this part, suddenly here looking at a, um, a birch leaf, um, it creates a very different pattern. And when you look, and one of the things I love about being, being in, the, in the forest, is you're often looking at collections of leaves that create different patterns. And looking up at the sky you lose your sense of, um, of orientation where the, where the horizon is. So you're surrounded by this pattern. This particular part of the woods we're coming through now, these are hazel leaves, hazel trees, and then we're looking up. The majority of this wood that we're walking through is, is, is oak. A lot of it is oak, but it is a deciduous forest, so they're, they're native trees, and this is part of what is the great wood. It's been here for centuries and centuries and centuries. Whether some of it was planted, or some of it, most of it has just naturally arrived of its own accord. I'm hoping, I'm hoping we get to our destination. Do you think when you walk, you walk to a destination or do you just wander? Well, I've, if I'm really honest, I always feel very disappointed when the walk's over. Um, and I, I love the idea of setting out. There's an optimism to setting out. And then you get to the end of the walk and you think, oh, it's finished. And then you look forward to the next one. Um, I always remember going for a long walk with my eldest brother, Tim, when and we were out walking this long river trail and halfway through it, he said, I'm enjoying this so much, I'm gonna do this every year, forever. And I felt a bit like that with this walk, that I enjoyed it so much the first morning, I thought, I'm gonna do this tomorrow morning and the next morning. I was talking to Richard this morning about the idea of saying your prayers and whether you say them every day and why do you say them every day and what were you saying Richard? Well, I was saying that it's actually bringing it's bringing all of your life to the prayer and I think you when you walk you're doing the same you're bringing all of your life to the walk so you're bringing whatever mood or whatever difficulty you have and as you as you walk or as you pray you're kind of walking your life into place or you're praying your life into place so that the, I don't know, just by the action of this routine or this rhythm, you're kind of making order of the, the world in which you live or you're kind of becoming attentive to it in a new way. You're becoming attentive to something beyond yourself. I think the danger of a lockdown is that you can get sort of wrapped up in yourself and you can no longer see beyond and a walk and a prayer like prayer helps you see eternity i suppose that sounds a bit grand doesn't it <laughs> i love the pace of walking and i've tried cycling and running but one of the things about walking is that you can look all around you and you seem to be going at a pace where you can take it in and think about it. 
that even walking sometimes seems too quick because actually it's only when you stop, you really stop and you start looking that you notice the tiny things. Now you're an artist, Andrew. Do you think that art is almost like a meditation? Is it actually, do you think art is sort of learning to meditate, to be still, to be, to, to be able to look at something with a, with a deeper attentiveness? With, definitely, definitely. And um, somebody once said to me that, oh, that must take so long. And, and as if it was a surprise that something would take a long time to make. And, my reaction to that is I like the fact that things take time and actually when you're creating an image or creating a painting or creating a drawing or creating um, a print which is what I do mainly it takes lots and lots of time but by it taking time you hold on to something you keep it and I think over the last few years I've made about 40 um, relief prints but based on the pattern and the shape of different types of tree or different leaf form but it's helped me to consider what I've seen what I've noticed and look at it more deeply but also I think there's a, just a feeling of just sort of tracing and looking at shapes that are there and you can walk past very very quickly and to keep going what did you say So I've suddenly stopped mid, mid, mid flow. Um, it's about sort of revisiting something, seeing it again, seeing it in more detail. Um, and often, I know a lot of impressionist painters, a lot of great, the greatest artists of paint, who've painted the landscape have made their work when they're outside. And I sometimes find that's that's great, but very, very difficult to actually be here with the paraphernalia of having an easel and setting up would be complicated. David Hockney did it. David Hockney did it very well, actually, in North Yorkshire. And he painted in the woods. But it's always changing anyway. I mean, I, I sometimes think, um, and hopefully later on today, Richard said that I might be able to pop back to my studio. I've been making all these images using dots of colour and how the dots of colour sort of resonate and create a pattern of light in a very abstract way. That's one of the things I like about being here. We've actually missed the, um, the view of Dulwich of the, across the college. Have we got time to go yes, back? Yes, of course we have. We've come to the... We want to go back this way. time we have. Let's stumble through here. Let's go. Lord, when I consider the works of your hands, what are human beings that you should think of us? Just amazed at the size of these, these trunks. Look at that, the way that's been torn down. Look at that. of the trunk of that tree. It's just incredible, isn't it? It's like a secret space. Isn't it?
we're about five miles from Trafalgar Square. And in a moment, all going well, we're going to appear with this lovely view looking out across part of London, looking back towards London from where we are. Um, and we're in, we're in a landscape at the moment where we do feel sort of quite enclosed to underground or an un, under leaf as it were within this sort of forest of leaves and in a moment we'll be looking out out of the woods back towards London and seeing the different colours um, and hopefully just here so here we are standing on the edge of the woods, looking out underneath these lovely, beautiful oak trees to Grove allotment site. Um, and then in the distance, in the middle distance, you can see the very beautiful building of, of Dulwich College, which was designed by Charles Barry, one of our great architects. And I think you'll all agree that looking at across this view, you suddenly feel that you could be in almost looking at a piece of Italy. The architecture looks Italian and you'd be absolutely right that Charles Barry went to Italy, went to Florence, went to Rome. You've got this amazing sort of grey, misty image of, of the metropolis of London, skyscrapers and cranes. And looking slightly, I hope you can just see it, looking through there, we're seeing Battersea Power Station and turning around you can see the Millennium Wheel in the distance, Post Office Tower and on a really clear day, we might be able to just see St. Martin's or the spire of St. Martin. But I love the oddity of this landscape that we're in the woods looking across this fantastic rural allotment site to Dulwich College in the valley beyond to Greater London in the distance. It's amazing how much green surrounds London, isn't it? You, you kind of, when you're in the city, you sometimes think that you've lost creation, but it's, it's you know, the whole of that, those four out of those five miles is just trees, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's incredibly green, incredibly green. In fact, you know, when you come back and we'll, when we finish this walk and we go back to, 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 onto a road again, you sort of suddenly miss this. I really miss this. I love the, the sort of feeling of being in a space which is so green so unspoilt in a way. Well Andrew we've come to the end of our time together and thank you so much for, for getting me lost in the wood. <laughs> I suppose it's a bit like life we get lost but somehow when we get lost we we eventually come to the most incredible insights or revelations of, of, of wonder and that's a that's a revelation both of the wonder of nature but also human ingenuity with that beautiful building by Barry at Dulwich College. And looking beyond that to London, which we all love and miss being open with its energy and with its life. Andrew, um, can I thank you very much for, for being with me today, for getting me totally lost. <laughs> <laughs> it was marvellous. We've been concentrating so much on, on looking we lost our bearings, but I hope um, you've enjoyed the, the ramble and the tripping and the stumbling and finding ourselves. But where I wanted to take you to at the end was this wonderful sort of view out across London and this sort of feeling that London is this wonderfully complex place where at the moment it feels like nature is sort of taking over um, again. And we're hearing the sounds of leaves and the sounds of birds almost more than the sounds of aeroplanes and the sounds of traffic. And all our senses coming alive. Let us pray. Lord, you have made us for yourself. Today we have heard the snap of branches. We felt the sting of nettles. We've heard the woodpecker and the birds. We've seen just the most amazing variety of trees and we've looked up into the light and seen the many, many, many different greens and the light pouring through. 
like a pointillist painting. We thank you for the wonder of your creation, so much greater than us, so beyond us, so beyond even our imaginings. And through being with Andrew and the eye of an artist, I hope that we've seen some of the shape of things, some of the wonder of things, and the pure enjoyment we get from walking in the woods. But meanwhile, thank you all for being here. God bless, and I can see the hearts going up, which is lovely to see. And a real thank you to my dear brother Andrew and his dog, Bobby. God bless, and Andrew's just fallen on the ground, <laughs> tripped over one of those childhood roots. See you all. So um, thank you for joining us again for this Nazareth meditation. It was lovely having you with us for this walk in Dulwich Woods when we got completely lost, but eventually found the view. And now I'm back socially distancing in Andrew's garden. And this is their studio, uh, Helen Island and Andrew Carter, their studio, which they have at the end of their garden. And Andrew is just going to show us some of the inspiration which has come from walking around this area which he has used uh, in his art. Hello. Hello. Um, well this is um, my little workshop um, and Helen's workshop as well and um, after being up in the woods it's quite nice to be back in here thinking about what I might try and do today. Um, I've been working for the last few months on a series of um, grids of colour. Um, we were talking in the woods a little bit about the idea of making light with dots of colour. But I just wanted to show you something, Richard, if you can turn around and look at this whole wall of pieces. I decided on the first day of the lockdown that I wanted to do some work where I researched what I could do with a simple box of Windsor & Newton watercolours. And I sent off online for this nice little box of watercolours. They're beautiful ones. And I've set to them with these colours and the addition of extras I've made now, I think about 60 watercolours. And some of them explore colour. If we look at this one here, it works through a spectrum from yellow through to orange, up to red, through to violet, to blue, to green, and back to yellow again. Now that takes a colour spectrum, or half the colour spectrum. And then the piece here, for example, I've tried to sort of be thematic. That was the piece that was made on Easter Day. And I tried to make the yellows down the centre be the sort of the brightest, purest thing, which is like a piece of sunlight, with these colours going slightly towards orange on one side, slightly towards green on the other. So each piece that I've made has had a theme of colour, and the piece moving along here, which I called Woodpecker, I actually just, I, I took a series of photographs of the, the green spotted woodpecker and then used those colours in this piece that I've made. So they're using a grid, but each time there's something different happening. And in this particular piece, I was interested in the idea of the sun rising and the sun setting. So although these colours get deeper towards the bottom, there's suddenly this offset lighter pink. And then moving the other way, you've got a light blue working through to a deeper blue with this offset light blue set into it and it's a feeling of sort of being up and down the sun coming up the sun going down some of them i've made have just been purely about color um, and so this piece here i've taken four colors there's a red in the corner there's an orange here there's a um a color here that we, which is a um almost a black and then a turquoise blue so the colors mix four ways in between those those colors and they're all made with watercolor this piece here was based on the Dulwich College view that we've just seen, We're looking through the greens in the foreground to the colour of Dulwich College in the dist middle distance, and then the colour of the grey and the silvers of London in the distance. But I want them to be very abstract. I've been making some pieces of work recently which are exploring the sort of overlap of, of 
leaves that we were talking about. So this works with a series of drawings that crisscross over each other and then each layer where you get a transparency of colour, you get a yellow and then the grey, silver grey over the top, you get a mixture that's happening in between. But the majority of the works that I've been making, I've been using these watercolours and say, for example, if you mix up a particular green and if I'm, say, taking a yellow, lemon yellow, mixing it with a green, making a really lovely light green, I've been working on these pieces where I'm putting a spot of colour down and depending on the scale of the spot of colour, say that, that lovely disc of colour, it's about a centimetre across, and making sure it's wet enough, not too wet, but then at that point, taking that down and blowing the colour. So it almost has its own life then. So you're looking at a yellow and then what the green does next to it. But if you take another transparency, and if I was to mix up, say, a blue, and I put it next to this one, over the top of this, because the watercolour itself is very transparent, you can lay another colour down, take that one over the top, and you're then seeing the previous colour through that colour. So it's, you get this sort of transparency of light happening. Now, to me, I'm, I'm really excited by this because I don't quite know where it's going, but you can see just with those three very quiet tints how you can start to build something up. And then with this, this is more literal. This is a piece that I've made for... Windsor and Newton just as an experiment showing what, what their watercolours will do but the work that my work the things that I'm really concentrating on are much more about the abs abstract nature of things they're less to do with the picture so you look at this this fantastic cab um, cadmium red There's something incredibly satisfying about that when you take that lovely drop of pure red. And then hold on, hold on. Are you ready? Next to this green, these are opposites. So you've got quite a, an emerald green. And then if you, you watch this from the side, it's so lovely. What happens to that piece of colour? I suppose I started making these when we were told we had to socially distance. And you're not allowed to blow on anybody. So I've been blowing at my pictures for two months. I haven't spent hours. I've been working every day. I've been going for a walk and then spending about an hour and a half on a new piece. Underneath that piece, Andrew, there's one of your lino cuts. I just, uh, just want to show people the intricacy of that lino. These were the shapes of branches and the way branches intersect and interact. And that's just cut out of the liner. And then when that's printed, this is the print. You may recognize that as one of the prints from my book, The City is My Monastery, A Contemporary Rule of Life. Hold on a moment, just hold it there, Andrew. We used Andrew's prints and Helen's prints for the book because they just seem to me to to speak of the of the wonder of things that sometimes we scarcely notice but the pattern of of of, of twigs and branches and the incredible beauty of the shape of the trunks of trees twisting and lifting our eyes to something that is of god <laughs> 